you'll know that you've grown as a leader when people tell you something you don't want to hear. Business of Architecture, episode 327. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, Business of Architecture's step-by-step business training program for architects that shows you how to structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to do the work you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today's guest should need no introduction, but you may not have heard of him before because the firm he led as CEO from 2003 to 2017, one of the largest and most successful architecture firms in the world, doesn't revolve around the fame of one individual. Our guest today is Patrick McLamey, former CEO of the firm HOK. McLamey just released a book on his experience in leadership and business through his time at HOK titled Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, The People, Stories, and Strategies Behind HOK. It's a fantastic book, and I highly recommend you waste no time getting out there and getting it. You can find it on Amazon.com, or you can go to MacLamy, that's M-A-C-L-E-A-M-Y.com to pick up that book. MacLamy is also the chairman of Building Smart International, which an organization working to achieve open standards for the exchange of digital information in the building and infrastructure industries. He was a founding member of Building Smart in 1994. McLamey spent 50 years at HOK, which grew into one of the largest architecture and engineering firms in the world during his time there. McLamey rose from junior designer to CEO of HOK and witnessed the firm's growth from a single Midwestern office to 27 locations across the globe, offering architecture, interiors, engineering, planning, and more. McLamey joined HOK in St. Louis in 1967, after which he helped establish the firm's San Francisco outpost in 1970, later becoming managing principal of that office. He joined HOK's executive committee in 1995 and was later named COO five years later. In 2003, HOK shareholders elected McLamey chief executive officer, and he led the firm for 13 years. In 2016, McLamey chose a new CEO for HOK, remaining as chairman for one more year before retiring, or as he liked to say, repurposing. In this episode of the Business of Architecture podcast, McLamey shares hard-learned business lessons from his time at HOK and the principles that led this company to be the success that it is today. Hello, I want to welcome all of our listeners out today. Today we have the wonderful opportunity to have a special guest with us. Today I welcome Patrick McLamey, who is the former CEO of the architecture firm HOK. Patrick, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Patrick, to start out with, now, I hopefully no one doesn't know what HOK is, but tell me what is HOK? Okay, well, HOK is, uh, is uh, a design firm. It's more than architecture these days, but it started out with three men whose initials, whose last names start with HOK, George Helmuth, Gio Obata, and George Casabon. And uh, the firm was started in 1955 in an unlikely place, St. Louis, Missouri and has now grown uh, to one of the largest AE firms in the world with uh, about 2,000 people in 27 locations around the world. The year I stepped down, 2017, HOK worked in 87 countries and uh, worked on about 4,000 projects uh, that year. And that's a pretty typical year. So we do, um, HOK started as an purely an architectural firm, but because of the founders uh, who had a keen desire to avoid the boom and bust cycle of the typical architectural practice, 
the firm became as diverse as the founders could possibly make it. And that was due to George Helmuth. And let me just tell you briefly about him. Uh, Papa George, we called him, was born and raised in St. Louis. His father and his uncle were both architects. And George grew up as the son of an architect in St. Louis and watched his father and uncle um, go through boom and bust cycle one after the other. When the firm had work, the Helma family was well off. And when they, when the firm ran out of work, they, they weren't poor, but they had to tighten their belts. And he was seared by that experience, uh, but still wanted to become an architect. Went to the local university, Washington University in St. Louis, a very fine private university offering good coursework in architecture. And uh, had the bad fortune to graduate in 1930. In 1930 was the beginning of the Great Depression. And he wanted to work for his father and his uncle, join their firm. And his father and uncle said, I'm sorry, we cannot afford to have you. Uh, we're down just to our two, two selves and scrapping for everything we can get. So he found another job working for the city of St. Louis, designing uh, restrooms and park benches and bus stops. Um, every year he would go back to his father and uncle and say, can you take me on now? Well, no, they couldn't. So after six years, he finally had had enough. And his father said, look, George, if you want to learn how to practice architecture, leave St. Louis, go to a larger city, go to a bigger firm and see how they do things. Maybe you'll learn. So he did. He left St. Louis, went to Detroit, Michigan. Uh, why Detroit? Well, Detroit was booming in those years because people were buying automobiles. So the auto industry was growing like topsy, even through the Depression. And George got a job with Smith Hinchman and Grills. That's the predecessor firm to the Smith Group today. Uh, and he got a job as a junior designer, much like the first job I got with HOK. Uh, the firm continued to prosper, but they saw that Helmuth had some real skills in the marketing area. So they invited him to join what was called then their solicitation department. And George began to call on clients and put together proposals. And uh, as he did, the firm would, uh, even though they were large, they would still lurch from having too much work to not enough work. And Helma saw this boom and bust cycle all over again at Smith Engineering Grills. So he wrote a 22 page paper, uh, single space typed paper, no computers then, just typewriters, uh, giving his strategy for how to develop uh, a firm that would never go, never suffer the boom and bust of a, of a depression firm. What were, his, what were his thoughts? Diversify the work you do. Don't just learn how to do one building type, learn how to do all of them. And uh, it was based on the idea that if a firm wanted to improve, they had to have employees, they had to have people and keep them long enough so that the people learned how to work together as a team and grew in their skills and their experience and their knowledge together. And instead of hiring for the next job you got and then laying everybody off at the end, which is more what his father and uncle did. Uh, he also said in order to do this uh, highly diversified firm, you need to be in more than one city. Uh, maybe if St. Louis is slow, Detroit will be busy. Or maybe if Detroit is slow, maybe St. Louis might have enough work to keep some of the Detroit employees busy. So diversify geographically by building type and finally by service type. Some clients need architects, some need interior designers, some need engineers, planners, landscape architects, programmers, and on and on and on. Learn to stick with those clients and give them whatever they need at the time. And you'll make clients more or less continuous clients instead of once in a lifetime clients. He showed this paper to the Smith Hinchman and Grills people who were not interested. They just were concerned about the next job in order to keep the payroll going. So 
he had recruited um, Minoru Yamasaki to Smith Instrument Grills from New York City. Yamasaki, Japanese American, was born and raised in, in uh, Seattle, went to the University of Washington Architecture School, went to New York to work. And uh, Helmuth recruited him from New York to Smith Hinchman because he said, another ingredient that a firm needs to uh, be depression proof or recession proof was a good designer. You need to have somebody that loves design and focuses on design. So he recruited Yama first at Smith Hinchman, and then when Smith Hinchman turned him down on his depression proof, proof firm strategy, Helmuth recruited Yama to break away with him and form a new firm. And they also con convinced uh, a senior production architect, Joe Lineweber, to go with them. They formed Helmuth, Yamasaki, and Lineweber. Now you might know, some of you that are listening, probably know who Yamasaki is. He's the Minoru Yamasaki that designed the World Trade Center. And that was later in this story, uh, after the firm had been split apart. So Helmuth and Yama and uh, Joe Lineweber began work in, I think it was 48 or 49, 1949. And uh, Helmuth opened a second branch office in St. Louis where he was from. He knew everybody in town because he had worked at City Hall. And he began to get work in both St. Louis and Detroit. And Yama soon was traveling back and forth designing and needed help, uh, needed a design assistant, especially after the firm got their first big job, which was the St. Louis Lambert Airport new uh, terminal building. So Yama recruited uh, Gio Obata, a Japanese American from Berkeley. Um, and Obata went to work for Yama and soon was transferred to St. Louis. Anyway, it's a long story, but Yama didn't like the commute. He wanted to stay in Detroit and do signature buildings, and he wanted a partner that would help recruit, re, re, get those kinds of projects. Helmuth wanted every project and believed that every single project, no matter how modest, has a design gem inside of it waiting to come out. And uh, so he and Yama decided they would split up, split the firm, Yama took the Detroit office, Helma took the St. Louis office, and uh, asked Gio Obata and George Kassabam, a young production architect, to join him. That was 1955. And uh, the firm already had some backlog of work because of the old Helma Yamasaki Lineweber work. So the firm started with 14 people. And Helma then began to exercise his firm, his, his depression proof firm strategy by working uh, as a full-time marketer. We think maybe the first person in the profession to ever do that. He also believed that uh, if you have a firm with at least three principles, each one should specialize in something. Many partnerships uh, are made up of people who do everything. The partners recruit uh, the, the project, they, they sell themselves to, the, to a client, they design it, than the oversee production and construction. And Helmuth believed that if you do something every day, you get better at it. So it's better to have partners doing things that help you and you can help them. So he, he was a full-time marketer. Obata was full-time in design. And George Kassobaum was full-time in production. That's how the firm was started. And with some, uh, with some wrinkles, uh, the firm is pretty much like that today. Every HOK office, major office, has uh, three leaders, except now we have four. Turns out that George Kassebaum had been doing two jobs. He was not only leading production, but he was also uh, leading the administration of the firm. He ran mm -hmm. the accounting team. He was the first, we think HOK was the first firm to hire a lawyer to become in-house instead of using uh, legal services from an outside lawyer. Because architects, all of you listening, if you're not working with contracts, you should be. And if your clients are giving you contracts and you're just signing them, maybe you should have a lawyer look at them first. So HOK, when I joined, was 150 people. 
12 years after it started. And by then, it was still one office, St. Louis, Missouri. That's where I began. And uh, I had no intention of staying. But within two years, they had shipped me to a project office in Pittsburgh. And one year after that, Patrick, we need you to help us. We're opening a brand new office in San Francisco. And we've got too much work and we need some help. So I had never been west of Denver. And I found myself in San Francisco, which was stunning to me. I, I grew up in a place where water is brown and the air is gray. It's not, it's not sparkly clear and blue. So uh, uh, I've been in the Bay Area since, except I've also traveled in the course of work for HOK, something like 4 million miles by air all around the world um, to every continent, so except Antarctica. So uh, that's a little thumbnail, but the firm is still incredibly diverse. Uh, the firm is still uh, has full time marketing. The marketing has changed in the early days of the firm. George Helmuth, by his force of personality and salesmanship, could actually sell a client on having HOK do the work without meeting Gio Obata or George Casabam or other members of the team. Now, these days, the marketers find the work and their job is to bring the HOK team that will do the work together to meet the client. So everybody at HOK at one point or another sells themselves to a client, uh, uh, which is probably more true for most of the people listening here today. Clients want to know well, who's actually going to do this work. And uh, so we're all selling ourselves, but the full-time marketing is still going on. Well, that's a long kind of monologue. <laughs> Maybe you Patrick, should. there's 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 two questions I want to ask you to dive into what you just shared there. The first one is Yamasaki. So that firm split up because Yama didn't like the commute down to St. Louis, as you described, right. and his firm continued on. And as you mentioned, right. they were able to do the World Trade Center, so they still did a lot of signature buildings around the world. But today, the the destinies of those two firms, HOK and Yamasaki, uh, are very different. And so yeah. I'm just curious from your from your perspective. What are the principles and the decisions that yeah. led to the different outcomes for both of those firms that started from a very similar seed? Right. That's an excellent question. Um, yes. After the firm was split into, Yama took the Detroit office. And I call him Yama because that's what Helmuth called him. Gio okay, Obata fair enough. always called him Mr. Yamasaki. That was just the way he was. Both Gio and Yama were Niseis, that is, firstborn in this country of Japanese immigrants. Uh, Gyo from California, Yamasaki from Washington. Yes, Yama kept his office, his practice going, um, and he focused on signature projects. He, he renamed it Minoru Yamasaki and Associates. Joe Lineweber's name was taken off the, the, the door. Joe worked for him for some years, but eventually became kind of a of a project architect consulting to other firms. And uh, Yama's big goal was to do signature projects, and he certainly did in the Detroit area and elsewhere. And probably the capstone of his career was to the design of the World Trade Center. And uh, there's a little funny story I want to tell about that. I was in New York City with Papa George Helmuth, Yama's old partner, uh, calling on a client one day and in the afternoon as we were driving through Manhattan, the Vista opened up down one of the big avenues of the city and there was the twin towers of the World Trade Center with the sun shining at just the angle so they glistened in the in the sky. And he he told the cabbie, stop the cat. And he pointed out the window and he said, see those see the twin towers there? Yes. And he said, well my old partner Yama designed those and I'm proud of him. But that son of a bitch didn't wasn't registered when he first came to work for me, so I had to stamp his drawings. Now that's <laughs> honestly not true. Helmuth was an earthy guy, uh, but he was proud of him. But Yama didn't have all the ingredients. He was pretty young then. Uh, the two firms. Let me get around to your your question. Minori Yamasaki Associates is 
kind of a classic traditional black cape firm, I would say, or Stark Attack firm. It lives and dies with the founder, the person that gives it reason to for existence. Once the founder is gone, once the star is gone, the firm tends to go out of business. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, Roche and Dinkaloo were successors to uh, to uh, er Errol Saarinen's firm. But mostly, those firms go out of existence. Helmuth and his partners wanted a firm that would outlast the, themselves. They wanted to build a firm that carried on past the partners' careers. Uh, they did things like make the firm, uh, from the very beginning, a corporation instead of a partnership. And instead of having partnership shares or ownership shares, they had stock. And uh, the firm that, that to this day has stock, out of the 2,000 people at the firm, about 300 are shareholders. Um, and um, the, the rules about that were crafted carefully to keep the firm going. Uh, if you left the firm for any reason, you got, you, you died, you left for go to another firm, you retired or something else, uh, your stock has to be sold back to the firm uh, as you leave, and the firm must pay you for those shares. So the, the shares are kept for active employees, which means that we don't have the wife or the child or the spouse or the son or daughter of one of the founders running our firm. Uh, it's active employees and only. And the, the founders also said, look, in order for this to work properly, we're the three big dominant players today, but we want there to be a, a, a second and third and fourth generation. We should sell our shares back to the company at age 65. And we could continue to work if we want, but we should let other people get a chance to buy shares and uh, bring them along before we're ready to stop working. So they did some very far-sighted things legally and uh, of course with the strategy about marketing and uh, being as diverse as possible. And it led to uh, almost continuous growth for the firm. A few years of uh, down of dips, but mostly no roller coaster ride, let's say that. Uh, uh, crises, problems, what happened in 9-11, what happened in the 2008 meltdown, uh, recessions, of course, those things affected the firm, but far less than uh, the typical firms that uh, either all of you uh, operate or that you know of. Which leads into my, my second question, Patrick. Thanks for explaining the, the distinction there of sort of creating the catalyst that allowed people in the firm, team members to take ownership, and then the very interesting requirement that if someone leaves the firm, they need to sell so it continues to be people that have vested interest. I just did the math, and if my math isn't incorrect here, you said in, in about 10 or 12, in 12 years, it grew to about 150, which is when you started. Now, I'm sure they, they probably pulled in more people near the latter end of that. I'm not sure. But that's about, on average, about 12 and a half people per year, which yep. is is quite an accomplishment. I mean, on that's onboarding a new person every single month for... Yeah you know, for, for 12 years straight. Oh, yeah. What do you think from what you saw, what, what would have been the, the key that allowed them to sustain that growth and not just have it turn into a circus of everyone pulling their own direction, doing yeah. their own thing and, and staying coordinated as a, as a team? Yes. Well, in fact, it did turn into a circus. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it was one office in St. Louis, Missouri. Everything we had, what we called and still called today, HOK culture. And HOK culture is very simple and very clear. Everybody, when I joined the firm, it was clearly understood. It took me a few days to figure out, oh, inside of HOK, it's like a big family with collaboration and coordination and cooperation. We help each other on the inside so that we can compete better on the outside. Mm. Take the friction out of the inside of your firm, not having people climbing over each other to uh, win the next job or be noticed and in instead help each other to succeed. That was straight from the founders. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I can pause you right there, Patrick, just because it rolled off your tongue so simply, but 
knowing organizations, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. And as the yeah. former C CEO of HOK, I'd like to get your insight on how do you maintain that kind of culture when you need to have accountability, when you need to have, you know, you need to be able to correct people if they're going off the tracks, but at the same time, you want them to feel like family. Yes. Yes. Oh, boy. Well, uh, th th that's covered in many different chapters of the book because there are different mm -hmm. things that have to be done. But where we began to go off the rails is as follows. As, as long as the firm was one office in St. Louis with three the three original founders, everybody pretty much fell into line. There was a saying, um, if you don't fit with HOK culture, uh, you'll leave sooner or later, so you may as well leave sooner. Mm. It was that strong. And it was unspoken almost. The founders didn't have to post the edict on the bulletin board or make big speeches. It was just there. When I showed up, it was there. Where it started to unravel has to do with the growth beyond St. Louis with other offices. Mm. The first office that started uh, beyond St. Louis was the one I helped to start in San Francisco. But that was uh, all HOK people moving to San Francisco. There were four of us and basically carrying that culture with us. But when, and, and so uh, as our office grew from the original four to something like 200 people today, that culture naturally took root there because we made it our business to uh, nurture that kind of thing. Uh, and the other, there's another piece to this that I want to make clear. It's how you treat your employees. If someone is doing a good job, you praise them in public. If someone is doing something they should not do or is falling short, you do that privately. So I never heard anybody publicly criticized at the original office or, or any place. So that's another important piece of your culture is the le leaders have to lead. And that means you have to get out of your office, you have one, get out of it, get with the people that are doing the work. The leader's job is actually not leading your people, it's the servant of your people. The leader's job is to help the people get the work done because they're the ones that are doing it. Mm. Leaders typically are hustling around trying to keep the firm going, trying to get that next project, trying to hire that next person, whatever it is. So uh, if this is a, this is a, people will follow you if you're a leader and you, and you believe in and actually act out on the, those principles of harmony inside is the best way to compete outside. The firm started to, uh, fall apart though when um helmuth was in a hurry and he said you know anybody that's anybody needs to have a new york office and instead of sending some hok people there to open an office he found a firm to buy the old con and jacobs architects manhattan firm that uh, did a lot of work in the midtown area um, and uh, it was a typical partnership where the, the last uh, partner alan jacobs was uh, uh, Bob Jacobs, excuse me, was uh, the last remaining partner and he didn't have enough, there was no, not enough money in that firm for him to retire. So he sold the firm to HOK and HOK put one person in that office, a marketer, to try to help get more work. It happened to coincide with a real downturn in the market, but the people in that office and the old Con Jacobs office did not want to be part of HOK. And they were led by a couple of people, uh, just young designers, who thought that they weren't going to they weren't going to put up with having country bumpkins from St. Louis, Missouri, coming to the Big Apple and telling them what to do. That persisted until finally Gio got involved with it. By then, I was in San Francisco, but Gio came to New York and dismissed those two. Um, and we also found that we, we moved the office out of the old Con and Jacobs quarters to a new office space uh, in Rockefeller Center, actually, with a nice HOK logo on the door, and it began to change. So the other thing is you have to not be afraid of your convictions. If somebody is causing trouble and questioning authority or questioning the, the things that you hold dear, they don't belong. And uh, leaders have to take action. 
I had to do that plenty. I never liked it. But if it's necessary, it's necessary. So, yes, the sheer scale of HOK, as more and more offices were added, where people uh, came into the firm, never met the founders, didn't know who they were, knew their names, but didn't know anything about this culture. And how do you restore that across a worldwide organization is the problem that one of the, I, I faced three big crises when I became CEO, and that was the third one. The first one was we were out of cash. And the second one was that we had a bank and uh, an investor that wanted cash. And the third one was we weren't glued together as a firm. That's That comes later in the book, and I'd, I'd be glad to talk about that if you want, but there are many other good things to talk about. Let's, but, let's, let's, park, let's park those three things. That's a big topic, and I'd love to dive into yeah. that. I want to ask you on the topic of leadership. Now, yeah. you, you make a distinction between leadership and managing and yeah. the difference between those two. Yeah. Help me help me understand. So here's I'm going to give you a specific example. How would you handle the fol- the following situation? You're leading a team, it's earlier in your career and but you have the knowledge that you have right now about leading people and you find that your team is promising things but they're not ready at the deadline. So the deadline, you know, it's tomorrow and then suddenly you find out that all this stuff isn't happening on the drawings that you thought was supposed to be there. Now everyone has to stay up late and you end up missing the deadline and you have to push it back. How do you how do you have this conversation with your people? What does that look like? Yes, okay. That's an excellent question. And thank you for rescuing me from going through the three big crises. This we'll the, get there for sure. The, we'll get there. <laughs> the typical thing that people do is if you are, you, you said your team is not delivering what they promised and you're missing a deadline. And then you run into crisis mode of working all night and all the rest of it. You have to ask yourself the question, why are they telling you something that's not true? Well, it's because you've made your expectations clear that this has to be finished by Friday or whatever your deadline is, but you haven't done anything more than give your give the deadline. If you're not helping your people to succeed, they will promise you what they hear you saying you want and only uh, because they don't want to uh, incur your wrath. And it's only when there's no other wiggle room for them to, to, to say or do anything else that, well, we're just not there yet. And is it because they're bad people? No, it's because you didn't get involved with that team, helping to get down to the root of what's the hang up with meeting the deadline? What are the things that are that are in the way of accomplishing that? It might be a simple thing of, well, we need we need one more person to help draw something up or we need or we need better input from the mechanical engineer. Who, who knows? But. The way a good leader does this is a leader sits with the team and asks a thousand questions and to see if the leader can help unlock what the issues are that are that are preventing that team from making their objective, not telling them what to do, but asking the questions and discovering with them, oh, it's really because the mechanical engineer is late or it's really because uh, we don't have the right spec for that piece of equipment whatever it is. And then as they discovered it and they discovered that you were willing to listen to them and ask questions, their confidence in themselves will grow and they'll be more ready. You'll know that you've grown as a leader when people tell you something you don't want to hear. It's giving people the permission to learn and grow uh, with tutelage more than with uh, giving strong direction. Maybe strong direction is okay for the drill sergeant in the army, but it's not really good in a creative enterprise like architecture. You need to give people that freedom to make mistakes and to grow and learn and give them encouragement. So if you sit with the team, you've got this experience, you know how to make deadlines, you sit with the team and work with them by asking these questions, find out what the issues are, let them discover it. And there will be an aha moment when they'll say, oh, well, it's because we don't have all the the right information from the electrical engineer, whatever it is. Um, And then say, well, yes, well, maybe you should go get that. And then uh, see if if you can make a recovery plan for once you have that information. So it's getting out of your office, not giving orders or commands, but working with people and letting them find their way. If you do that, 
you will find that you've got people that are twice as good as you thought they were. Mm. That's the difference between managing and leading. Let, let's say, let's play devil's advocate and say that you've done that, but you still have the situation on your hands where the deadline wasn't met. It seems like from your perspective, although you, you take responsibility yourself, you're still thinking, man, they could have done more. It doesn't feel like they're stepping up to the plate. Yeah. How, how do you address and, and institute those corrections when the difficult conversations, potentially difficult, okay. need to happen? How, how would you handle sure. that? I mean, it is it's certainly true that not everyone knows how to put a job together or meet a deadline. Or uh, an, a typical HOK project will have three leaders. It'll have a project designer, a project architect, and a project manager. And the project manager is the one that's responsible for meeting those deadlines as scope, schedule, budget, scope, schedule, budget. Make those three things happen. Make sure that you, you've got all the right scope, that you keep to your schedule, and you and then you, you meet the budget for yourself and for the client in terms of construction cost. So project managers have an awesome job. And I was an old project manager. So uh, when we sit with project teams, I usually ask a lot of the questions and expected the project manager to answer. Now, if they're inexperienced, okay, give them some help. If they still don't seem to take to it, they're probably not in the right spot. So. Uh, it's okay to have a private conversation later with that individual who was your designated project uh, manager, let's say, and say, you know, it might be that you'd make a better project architect than project manager, or maybe you'd be better at um, band designer. So uh, don't be afraid to, uh, this happened to me. I was a young designer, but my bosses saw me working with the people around me to help make deadlines happen and said, you know, mm. you're a kind of natural at this project management stuff. Why don't you give that a whirl? And we got to tell you, if you do that, you can't, you have to give up being the lead designer. You can still provide input, but the project designer has the last word. And I thought about it for a day and finally said, you know, I think I would like that. And it mm. sent me off a whole new direction. So uh, people have to find themselves. Not everybody is suited for everything. Um, the other place that we have found uh, in HOK with enough people, uh, there are three little neat spots that everybody fits in. Maybe you're not a good project manager or project architect or project designer, but you can be a heck of a good specialist on healthcare or on uh, mm -hmm. sports architecture. Uh, we had uh, we have one person in our sports group that knows everything that there is to know about turf. He's a turf specialist. It's a, it's a young guy. He knows how to specify the right turf for these various uh, major league baseball and football stadiums based on the climate, how much sunlight it gets, uh, whether it's exposed to salt air and all the rest of it. So. Um, you have to help people find their spot. Uh, and not everybody is, in, is, is set up to be or, or is, is programmed to be a, a project leader of some kind. So uh, find the right place for people. Once you do, most people I found generally, once they get something that's satisfying, especially if they get that public praise for, you know, gee, you did a great job on that last uh, healthcare project with that specialty of how to put together the operating suite. Uh, public praise is a wonderful thing because, oh, somebody appreciates what I do. So that's another part of leadership is helping to find, helping people find themselves uh, what their strengths are and working with them. But it's a lot, you know, it's a lot like parenting. It really is. Yeah, and it's a real art to be able to see maybe something that someone can't see about themselves. Yes. Um, well, I, I do think it's a common characteristic of just human nature. Sometimes people around you can see things plainly and you just completely are blind to it. So, yes, having somebody that helps you through this transition. From, well, gee, I thought I was a project manager, but maybe I'm really something different. That's difficult for some people. That should be done privately, never publicly. 
because if people become embarrassed, they will always remember. And uh, that is not the, that is not the right way to do it. And that is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with our guest, Patrick McLamey. What a fascinating experience that he's been able to share with us here on the show today. You can find his book, which should be required reading for every current and aspiring architecture firm owner and leader over at mclamey.com. That's M-A-C-L-E-A-M-Y.com. Or you can also search for it on Amazon. I can't recommend it enough. At the end of every chapter is a summary of the hard-earned lessons that McLamey shares throughout the book. If you haven't already, please go leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to get some positive reviews. If you have some feedback or suggestions for the show, you can send those into podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. Also, if you have any guest recommendations or people you'd like to hear from here on the show, you can send those suggestions into that same email address, podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step business training program for architects that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of running a business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it isn't your architecture or design skills that are holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. That's what we aim to simplify. And if you want to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover a free on-demand training on the simple, proven, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing your best architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.